So today I have a really special episode to give you guys and it's basically a follow-up of a conversation I had with illustrator Katie Shelley and I'll let her introduce herself in that part of today's episode. Now I was hoping to do an episode that was more about tips that will help you kind of get started thinking about how to make money as an illustrator, kind of some practical tips and I'm still kind of writing and thinking that one through. So in the meantime, I'm really happy to give you guys this conversation and there's lots of good nuggets in there. What I like about this conversation is that it, it if you looked at the video I did last time, which is called Becoming an Illustrator or Breaking into the Illustration Industry with Katie Shelley, in that episode, we catch her at the very beginning of that step she took where she wanted to become a full-time freelance illustrator. So what's, what's that process look like two years down the road for her? And I know that a lot of you guys are in her scenario, in her situation where you are just starting out and figuring things out along the way. Before I get into it, just a few announcements. First of all, guys, I'm super excited to announce the launch of my latest Skillshare class, the style class. A lot of you guys will already know about this class that I had been thinking about it, writing it, and that I did launch it just in time for Christmas in 2020, which was now almost three weeks ago. So anyway, I'm super excited about it. Basically the style class is my best version of a class that teaches about illustration style and gives you some tips of how to navigate the question of how do I find my illustration style? How do you find your illustration style? And I will just give you a very summary version of how the class works. So as always, I like to give you guys the meat of what I'm thinking, what I call the primer. That's sort of a series of little lectures that describe my theory and my ideas and insights about the topic I'm teaching. And then there are the exercises and projects where we put that theory into practice. Style's a really tricky one because I can't really show you how to have your style that is a journey, but it's a daily project class. It takes place over 26 illustrations. You could do one a day or one a week, it's up to you. But the idea is you take what we learn in the primer and we apply that thinking. We have that in mind as we go through making a series of related illustrations, working them out in a very specific technique. And style is much more than the technique that you use, but it is pretty important that you do have a technique in your style, it's a huge ingredient. I think that's one of the big, the things that surprised me the most in this class was when you think about style, it seems very conceptual. It seems very big questiony, and not about the nuts and bolts of illustration about what brush to use and stuff like that. But I really get into, well, the basis of the class is really how you need to practice a technique and become almost masterful at it in order for it to become a part of uh, your identity, your style, your voice, however you want to put that. So anyway, the class is called The Style Class and I couldn't be more excited that uh, that I made this class and so far in less than three weeks, almost 2,000 students have joined the class, maybe even more. I think it's over 2,000 students at this point and there are well over 100 projects and that's a record for my classes in terms of just how much engagement has happened in such a short amount of time. So please go check it out. And this one was filmed professionally. It was shot professionally by the amazing people at Cassiar. They did just a, a fantastic job of making the class look as good as it can be. I love making classes with high production value, more than just me with you know my little setup that I do for YouTube videos and most of my classes, honestly. But yeah, they really uh, helped me make that class really something special and well, I'm also really pleased to say the class is already a staff pick on Skillshare and it's going to be featured on their site. So it's really getting the attention that I, I could only have dreamed it would get. So thanks guys for taking the class. Thanks for checking it out. I'm going to leave a, a link in the notes here, of course, where you can go and find that class. 
I almost forgot. I actually squeezed in one more Skillshare class between my style class and now. Uh, last Thursday, I recorded a live session on Skillshare called Printmaking Inspired Illustration in Photoshop. And here I go and I dive deep and show you guys exactly how I illustrate in Photoshop and I go through each step along the way, what Photoshop brushes I use, what's my setup, how do I connect my iPad to my Mac to use it as a graphics tablet. It's all in this class. Now it was a live session. We recorded it for an audience on that specific day. And so that live portion has come and gone. It's, it's done. It's it's now with Skillshare's video team and they're putting it together as a full class that will be on my Skillshare page, on my Skillshare profile. So I'm expecting within three to four weeks that that class will become available. So if you missed the Zoom session last week, don't worry, it's gonna become a full class and it will be up on Skillshare uh, soon and hopefully very soon. So again, I'm, I'm excited to actually have launched two Skillshare classes, basically, or not launched at least. I've worked on and developed and produced two Skillshare classes in the last month. So that's, that's a record for me also. Anyway, let's just get into the interview with Katie Shelley and I'll see you on the other side just to wrap things up. Okay. Yeah, so um, Katie, uh, what, sorry, <laughs> see, this is it. Katie, why don't you introduce yourself and uh, we'll go from there. Sure, uh, my name is Katie Shelley. I'm a freelance illustrator. I've been doing full-time freelance for maybe about two, three years now. And I live in Spain. I'm originally from New York. And we spoke last almost two years ago now, which is unbelievable about my career. And now we're doing a follow-up. That's right. So yeah, thanks for being on the call. And yeah, for the audience, Katie and I talked, yeah, and was it 2018? August 2018, I believe. 2019. 2019? Yeah, it, it so feels... we're coming up on, I think. Oh yeah, it, it, was, it was about just over one and a half years ago. And so yeah, K Katie had contacted me about uh, some questions she had about breaking into the illustration industry things like which do I do I need to make a postcard and you know how do I get from small jobs to bigger jobs and stuff like that and I said let's let's make a, a YouTube video out, out of this and, and just share it with the audience so we did that and it's been one of the most popular classes or <laughs> classes it's been one of the most popular videos on my on my YouTube channel and so I always wanted to follow up with you a couple years later and just see like as an example because I think you're you're actually a lot like what I think and imagine my YouTube audience is like it's it's people mm -hmm. who are breaking into the illustration world and they want to you know get from zero to doing it and feeling like a legit illustrator and and even your age bracket, I feel like like a lot of people are where where you are and where you were when we talked last time. So, yeah, I think I think I just wanted to follow up and, and see like what have we learned since since back back two years ago, and um, you know we talked about style direction you know, how to develop your style. We talked about getting, like I said, getting more legitimate clients. We talked about um, postcards specifically. We talked about getting a portfolio review by uh, an established illustrator. So did you want to start anywhere particularly or? Not in particular. You can go ahead and decide. Yeah, well, I think, I think the big question is uh, between that time that we chatted last time and now what's happened? Like what, what have you been working on? Uh, what's the same, what's changed? Well, 
I've been working really steadily um, on mostly the types of clients that we've been talking about. So um, not quite family and friends, but maybe people who are like one or two degrees of separation from people I went to college with or um, friends of family and that sort of thing. Um, so I think maybe in my head, everything seemed like it was going to be much more like flipping a switch from off to on of like, okay, now I know how to promote myself as an illustrator. And now I know how to like, you know, I cleaned up my portfolio mm -hmm. and now like, I flip the switch and <clears throat> I'm working with advertising agencies and like the Atlantic magazine and like all these sort of fancy clients. So in reality, um, of course it wasn't, it hasn't been like that. It's been very gradual and it's very organic. And sometimes mm -hmm. it feels like two steps forward, two steps back, like anything in life, I guess. Um, but overall, like if I zoom out and look at the graph, like I know that I am growing as an illustrator, I'm getting better at what I do. Um, and I'm, I actually had a milestone recently, which is, um, I haven't gotten the job yet, but I was contacted by an advertising agency to do some illustrations for a brand. So I consider that to be like graduating to the next level of client, if you will. Totally. Um, so I'm super happy about that. And that's um, really recently? Really recently, yeah. We're still sort of in discussions about budget and whether or not that will come through or not, I don't know. Um, but even just the fact that they contacted me, I think they found me on social media. <clears throat> um, just the fact that they contacted me, I think is a really good sign. Hmm. So yeah, I, it's, it's been very gradual, very slow and steady. Yeah, go ahead. Can I ask what direction, like, do you know what stylistic direction they were at attracted to in what you're doing? They, um, they wanted something um, analog, brushy, um, like ink with splashes of, of color sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Right, so, so the painterly, the, you could say. Okay, kind of like the the portraits that you do. Yeah, maybe a little bit more informal. Um, okay, but similar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there is a bit of a a time delay between our, our um, conversation here. I'm wondering if if, uh, if if we can try to start a new Zoom call and see if that's going to fix it because it's actually pretty it's a pretty long delay. Do you mind? Sure. All right, I'm going to, so for the audience, we're just going to, we're having some technical difficulties. We're going to sign off and sign back in and, and pick up where we left off. So anyway, we were talking about your, you you had a a chat with an agency or an advertising agency, and we were just chatting about the, the style they wanted you to uh, work in. And I, the reason I was wondering that is because you had dis described a style that you were wanting to do more of the last time we chatted, where it was more, you called it cartoony, and I think it, like more whimsical, maybe more character driven versus like representational and, and, and naturalistic, so to speak. And mm -hmm. so when you're contacted by an agency, and you have this big opportunity, in my experience, sometimes there's a bit of a catch where they, they saw some work that you did, that you're proud of, but you we're hoping that people noticed the thing that you really want to be doing. So I'm wondering how that lined up for you, whether whether it was kind of the way I described it or is it, is it more like ideal for you? I think the style that they want me to work on is pretty ideal for me. That's awesome. Yeah. I think as far as the style discussion goes for me, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I have found it so difficult to nail down a style. Um, which is why I'll be taking your style class on Skillshare at my, <laughs> as soon as I can. Um, <clears throat> but for me, it's just been difficult because I enjoy working in lots of styles. Um, sometimes when I sit down to practice, which I have been doing more of since our last call, it was something that I mentioned, 
um, that I felt like I needed to do more of. I have been doing more of that. Yeah. Um, and trying not to feel guilty about it. Um, <clears throat> sometimes when I sit down to practice, like it seems like what comes out is like almost like random. Um, so I found it n very not straightforward, very difficult. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like so much intuition is involved. Like it's so, it's so not something that you can, I'm curious to see how you handle it in your class um, <laughs> because it's not something you can boil down to a formula. Um, yeah. But perhaps, and I have a feeling this is what I think your class is about. Perhaps a, a dedicated practice can kind of get you there. Um, and that's, where I imagine my style needs to go is some kind of in-between zone that I don't even know what it is yet. And that's part of the part of the deal, I think, with style. Like, and I think it's why I'm not why previously, like in the Charles Hively review, I wasn't that excited about the botanicals because yeah, technically I can draw like an, an a very nice looking flower or cactus or plant or whatever. And it's enjoyable for me, but it doesn't feel like me. It doesn't feel like my voice um, because it's just a plant. And a lot of people draw plants in that way, I guess. So it didn't really feel totally unique to me. Yeah. Not, not that botanical illustrations can't be a place to develop a voice, but it just doesn't feel like the place where I'm going to do that intuitively like it feels like I'm just more instinctively drawn to people food objects like more whimsical things yeah so and more like ideas yeah that that are beyond just observational or representational yeah exactly so I could have certainly taken, I guess you could say the shortcut and said, okay, these botanical illustrations are the ticket to commercial gigs. I'm just gonna ride this wave, but I chose the hard way, I guess. <laughs> and yeah. I'm, still, I'm still on that road very much almost two years later, but um, I feel like something's gotta happen. <laughs> um, it's almost like going out to fish and just hoping to catch a fish. Like, I feel like I trust that I will. I feel like there's something there and I feel like it's it's like this in-between mm -hmm. place that I just haven't discovered yet. Yeah, and maybe going with the fishing analogy that there's different ways to get the diff uh, different kinds of fish. I don't, I'm not, I'm not a big fisherman, but I do know that like if you're fishing for sockeye salmon it's different than if you're fishing for um marlin is that a fish those big fish with the big spiky things i think so yeah yeah so i was gonna say merlin because my kids have been watching wizard <laughs> movies but um yeah i think i think you know what tackle you use what bait you know whether you're you're moving in the boat or fishing off a dock you know there's there's lots of different yeah. sub analogies in there and I, I actually think it's very commendable that you're doing what you call the hard way. And, mm -hmm. and I really, I identify a ton with the, the like, yeah, I could, I'm, I'm artistic. I can draw things. I can use a paintbrush and I can depict things that I see in an, in an acceptable way that a lot of people can't. And it's not that I'm ungrateful for those things, but those to me, don't excite me and they right. don't seem particularly saleable or merchandisable at the, at, the, at, the, at the end of the day. I want to be a commercial artist and I want something that stands out as my unique product. And, right. and so that, that drive to find a thing that's your own, you're, you're shaping, you're molding a pro your product. And I, th I think that's commendable. And the things that you're good at kind of at the more default level, like your botanicals, as you describe it. it and by the way, I think your, your, botan your botanical illustrations are beautiful. Like, I think that, that they're great, but, but I, I do agree that they're, they're not as distinctive as, 
as you could be. And I actually, I, I was listening to our last conversation about what Charles said, you know, don't, don't show, don't do what you're trying to do, do what, do the botanicals, because you're good at that. You're not, I mean, it all, it's almost seems like you said, you're not good at all this other stuff, but you're good at that. Right. And I disagree, like, he's, he's really, it's, it seems like an impatient answer. It seems like, like, here's, here's the shortest route to being a successful, doing something like this for a living. But right. it's a shortcut, but a shortcut to what? More of that? More of something you didn't want to do? So I think that, that that's, it's the easy path. And there is something you'll take from that. I think this is, I cut myself off a few moments ago. I think there is something that you'll take from that basic skill that you have and it will find its way into your work. And it is finding your, its way into your, um, your portraits that you do, which I think are beautiful and they're distinctive. And, and it seems to me that that direction with the, the, the flashes of paint strokes and more elemental line work. And it's what I would call representation with a stylistic flourish. I know that sounds kind of corny, but it seems to be a, a place that is definitely more unique to you. And it's, there's a, there's more to it than there's layers. There's, there's, it's more than like paint a cactus. And, and so what I'm seeing is an unexpected development. You thought it would be more whimsical characters with, you know, rubbery arms or something like that. Right. But now something's emerging that you're good at and is distinct to you and seemingly on the on the verge of becoming in demand. So I think is that is that a fair assessment? That's I love the way that sounds because it sounds like um, you've taken something that has felt very chaotic and um, confusing to me and and turned it into something that makes sense. So <laughs> I'm happy to hear it sort of explain in that way. And I think it could be framed in that way. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I, I know the style conversation is, it's, it's something that every illustrator wants to talk about, especially at first. And then once mm -hmm. you start getting into it, especially someone with design experience like you have, um, it feels almost like a, 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 like a besides the point questions like, this and a lot of a lot of illustrators and designers hate the word style they hate talking about it they, they feel ashamed of talking about it. i've heard this on podcasts i listen to people are like i don't want to they kind of tiptoe around it but it is such a an important conversation to have and i, I think it's just so you're going to have it whether you like the idea of style or not you're going to be thinking about it and and i just I was so curious to know what was your story between before and, and like what you thought you would do in 2019 versus what's happening. And my, my, in my experience, style is a bit of being intentional and trying things and trying to have a system and a formula and then finding out that your preconceptions and your formulas don't really work every time and you, you kind of chip away at it over time. And mm -hmm. you, you find whether you, you have this one thing that you do all the time formulaically, <clears throat> or, you, or you find that there's something kind of broader and more vague that you bring to all your work, even if it's stylistically disconnected every time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in my style class, um, since we were talking about it, the the, pro, the the I really don't know how to teach people style, right? It it's it's not something I can teach people how I do things, but what I do in the first I would say maybe forty five minutes or an hour of the class is just go through a lot of these kinds of conversations, but I kind of boil them into kind of more concise thoughts, 
and and mm -hmm. then and then it's really about having those things in mind as you're working over time the whole thing about this multi-day project is that it's kind of a microcosm of what we all do as illustrators to develop our, our voices anyway we do it over mm -hmm. years but we but we but um very few of us will give ourselves a chance to do it over like a concentrated amount of time and just chip away at one technique and one idea or one series of ideas and just see what happens and, and so that's really like what the class does but in one of the primer parts where i talk about some of those ideas i have the idea of like the artist type illustrator and the designer type illustrators i have these two types of illustrators and one is that the artist type is more like the kind of person that you'd you'd always see this exact same motifs showing up again same colors same visual language every time and they, it feels like they really just know themselves and they really just like have this one thing that they've decided they're so decisive and like um and I, and i think like andy j pizza's uh like that you always see those same things i think of olympia zanoli she always has the same kind of visual language uh, the list goes on but then there's the designer type who i i relate more to like christoph neiman who has brilliant ideas and you can tell a christoph neiman but you you can't really say all of his work has the same style so yeah. so um we find ourselves as illustrators kind of being more like one or the other or somewhere in between mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i think um i studied design and i worked at a museum of design for a long time um so i think i definitely have a design mind for sure. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of times people talk about design as problem solving. And I definitely approach illustration as, as problem solving. <clears throat> um, and I don't always see it as about me kind of putting my expression or putting my motifs on, on a project. It's more about how can I solve this brief or how can I help this company or this person or this organization communicate this idea. Mm -hmm. But then of course, like I was thinking um, when you were talking about artist type versus designer type, I was thinking about um, a lot of times like pe people say like, people with curly hair really wish they had straight hair and people with straight hair really wish they had curly hair. <laughs> yep. And a lot of times I find myself, you know, working or thinking about my work. Um, and saying to myself like, Oh God, like I'm, I'm like imposter syndrome stuff. Like I'm so not an illustrator. Like mm -hmm. I'm so not one of these people who sits down and like has this visual world that is mine and this, you know, expression that comes through my hand, et cetera. Like it's, it's much more of a very kind of a mundane problem solving thing. Mm -hmm. So it's like wanting to be the other thing all the time. I wonder if artists type people wish they could be more designer type. I do wonder that too. I have this probably like what you're describing. I, I imagine the the so-called artist types just being so confident, exuding confidence. And they can just like, you give them a big white wall and a, a black marker or something and you say, go right. at it. And they'll just go zoop, to the wall and start. Yeah. And I'm like, I envy that ability to have a visual language that like, you know, the second you touch something, it turns to gold versus mm -hmm. um, the designer type that's much more cerebral and has to think about it and plan and their first draft sucks. But I actually believe that that is the power of the artist illustrator is not that they can go and touch gold, is that there is a lot of process and you can't see it because because their, their style is so consistent. Uh, and the reality is for all illustrators, it all has process. It all has that, um, that drudgery behind it. And there's a great quote by Christoph Niemann that I just read in, I think it was Keep Going by Austin Kleon. And it's, it's something, I'm gonna butcher it, but it's something about how having a, a system and a process where you kind of 
step your way through to an idea through iteration or something like that. It's not sexy, but it, it keeps you sane. It keeps you from going crazy as an artist. I wish so much I had the quote because it, it really speaks exactly to uh, that idea of, of, I think, as a des designer type illustrator, that, that feeling like because, because of the way the process feels and looks, if someone were to see you illustrating, you, you imagine that it doesn't look illustrate or something like that. But I, I, my, my point is that I think that's everyone, you, no matter who, who or what kind of illustrator you are. I think we all have that drudgery element or that bland, yeah. dry process of, of just getting yeah. from one thing to the next. So um, in terms of, I wanted to move, move the, the, the conversation a bit. Um, you had, you had talked about your kind of working mostly for what, what we'll call small time clients, like friends and family and people through connections to more legit ones. And I've, I've noticed that you do have some, some more impressive clients listed in your website. You want to talk a little bit about who you've been working for in the last few years and what kind of growth you've seen there? Well, I think the weird thing might be that maybe an idiosyncrasy of my career or something that might maybe make me different from the like typical person who takes your skill share classes and stuff is I kind of like, I want to say I started with a bang <laughs> in my career and then was kind of like dormant for a while and then came back into it in earnest, if that makes sense. So um, I, I've worked at the Cooper Hewitt Museum as a media producer. So I was mostly doing video production, editing. Um, I did like website stuff, um, that sort of thing. Um, and every once in a while something it was handy to have an idea illustrated um, and I was able to do that. So I was working as a full-time employee at Cooper Hewitt, but basically I listed them as a client, even though right. I never worked for them as a freelancer. Um, so there's that. Um, and then uh, Chronicle Books was a book of botanical illustrations, which, so I have a, I have a friend who's an herbalist um, and through a different job, I had a contact with um, someone in publishing. So basically we were in a very scrappy way, put together a book proposal, which actually very surprisingly got picked up by Chronicle Books. But that was before I decided to make the jump to full-time illustration. Right. That must have given you some confidence to jump into illustration, having had that already. It did, yeah. yeah. And actually it was, even I would go a step further and say more than confidence, it was something that made me say like, why am I not giving this a shot? Yeah. Like I really, I did illust some illustration work previous to deciding to do it full time as I guess you could say moonlighting or a side hustle thing. I really enjoyed it, but I always thought, oh no, that's pie in the sky. Like I could never do that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then years later I said, no, I think I am going to try this because if, if for no other reason that like one day in the future, I'll always wonder what would have happened if I had stuck with illustration. So I just really, I had to give it a try to see what happens and here I am. <laughs> and here you are. So I guess you said a lot of the clients in your client list were kind of they predated your your so-called jump into illustration and yeah. and now more recently you do have you have some bites on the end of your line do you want to talk a little bit about just the what has happened since since our last conversation even if it's not quite what you'd hoped or just like what has that process been like of putting it out there into the universe i want to have more legit clients and that's your intention and then what what's what's come of that 
uh, and maybe maybe expected, unexpected, like what what does that look like for you? Yeah, um, I think like I said earlier, it's been just like a really slow upward mm. march. Like sometimes it feels like I make a big leap ahead and sometimes it feels like I'm dropping down a few pegs. So it hasn't by any means been like a linear thing or like an on off switch of like, oh, now I'm a legit illustrator. Like a right. month ago, I was just like pretend and now I'm real. It's like much more scattered. Um, really, I've been like, first, of all for income, but second of all, really for practice, like I've really been tugging hard on like this extended friends and family circle of people. Like to give you some examples, a classmate of mine from college sees my postings on social media. Um, we're not in contact, like I wouldn't, really call her a friend I'd say more of like an acquaintance from college but she has she's aware that I'm an illustrator she sees me on social media and she recommended me to a friend or colleague of hers who works at a small private school that basically they needed some illustrations for their fundraising campaigns mm -hmm. that sort of thing so I guess it's like a small to mid scale client it's coming through a contact like a sort of acquaintance type person um or there was another person i'm in a group on slack like i'm in a lot of online communities and one of them is called um and i can't remember which one i found her on it was, i'm pretty sure it was on Lady, it's, it's a group called Ladies Get Paid. Okay. And it's basically just like, it's tons of people from all over the world who are saying like, I need a freelance web developer or I'm looking for someone who can help me with my landscaping or like I offer whatever service. Wow. So it's okay. like this huge, yeah. Very broad. Um, international, yeah, very broad. It can be a little crazy sometimes. I honestly, I don't go in there a lot. Um, but one day I went in and I found, I, sometimes I just do a search for illustration. Um, and there was a person looking for a designer and illustrator for a deck of cards, which I can show you. Um, I designed and illustrated these cards for a client in Montreal, Canada. And they're actually, it's good that we're on a Zoom call because they're actually cards there for um, for Zoom calls. Oh, okay. So you can tell your colleagues, like, be right back. Like, if you're on one of these Zoom calls with lots of people, or you yeah. can just kind of clap. Oh, okay. Easier than pushing the little, finding the little, like, clap button. Yeah. Right. This sort of thing. Well, that's such a good idea. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah has, has anyone noticed these? Or like, ha, ha, what do you mean? <laughs> or like, ha, has anyone, like, I'm learning about them for the first time. I think other people mm -hmm. would like to know about it. Like, are people finding this and discovering uh, yeah. it? Um, I think so. It's it's pretty small scale thing. So basically, this client, this one's really useful. Mm -hmm. Um. So, oh, and you're seeing them backwards, right? No, you are, the but text? I'm not. Okay, <laughs> because that's, that's a setting too that you can adjust in Zoom to make sure that people can read it. Um, yeah. There's this one. Oh, that's cute. This was, one of, this was one of the more fun illustrations to do. That is so cool. That's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. So basically people like this, like this is just, you know, it's a, it's a sort of small business in Montreal that had an idea to make these cards and they were looking for someone affordable to do yeah. design and illustration. And I, I raised my hand and I said, Hey, I'd love to do it. Here's my portfolio. Right. And, and, and this was me, through so. this ladies get paid website. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's cool. That's, that's actually a very yeah. great outcome from something that I would yeah. be very skeptical of. A, like, I'd be like these groups that you go, it's hit or miss. 
like it could yeah. be good or it could be someone with like a, a weird idea like that's a great yeah. idea and it seems like you were perfectly matched to it so yeah that's great i think you ha you have to use your emotional intelligence to read if a person is serious that's about a, good way a job of putting it. or if they're you know so i, I felt that yeah a i felt that jess was for real yeah a lot of those 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 jobs like that come with a series of red flags and I love uh, yeah the emotional intelligence is I've never put it that way I've always I can I can sense like like if something's going to be just not up my alley and yeah. it's just a sense it's an intuition exactly yeah emotional intelligence yeah. Is, is basically like you like how are they writing the the brief or the email what's their, right. even like what is what is their email address and little things that you little cues that you can pick yeah. up on so yeah like do they have a website does mm -hmm. the website look professional or does exactly. it look kind of scattered like exactly do they look like someone who has produced good products in the past and like mm -hmm. knows how to manage a project and put together a project and do something and launch it or do is there no evidence that this person has ever successfully launched anything exactly yeah, yeah. and i and people sometimes have asked how do i pick and choose jobs how do i filter briefs that come come in and that's a big part of it is is just like you can tell from the different points of contact and how they you know how they communicate and then if you were to go to the website what's their website like i do a lot of that when people contact me for a job especially if it's a smaller job that seems like it would be a fun job but it's not going to earn earn me a lot maybe it's one of those yeah. jobs that I'll just enjoy doing. That's when I, I, yeah. I'm like, okay, what's this person all about? And it's funny, one thing I look for, and this is very much an aside, is like when people send a link, I'm like, I'll, I never click the link, no matter who sends it, because I don't want to be tracked. I don't want them to know when I read their email. A lot of people right. will, will give a link that's tracked. And so I just right click right. the link, strip back all the the information gobbledygook at the end of the URL and go to the thing that they want to show me <laughs> so I can look at them, look and judge them right. without, without them knowing that I'm judging them. So right. and that I haven't read the email. So that's a little side tip there is uh, if you don't like being tracked, <laughs> um, but even, even the, the fact that people do that can be a bit salesy and it can be a little clue as to like who you're dealing with. I, I, I know that some people yeah. love doing that, and they're totally legit and they're not schmoozy, but um, it is, it is a, it is one of the things that I look for in an email. Was like, did they, did they just send a trackable link? But um, yeah. And I, I will say like, I'm 33. I've been working for, I guess, 13 years now. After a certain number of years and experience with people, you just develop a sense. So like, mm -hmm if anyone's watching this and you're, you know, maybe in your early twenties, you're just getting started with everything in life and work. Like I would not have been able to filter through to find this client in my early twenties. Like, and I can say in my early twenties, I did a bunch of gigs and like work and stuff and just got completely screwed or burned out or like treated poorly or not paid properly and all these things so like i had to go through all of those experiences to develop that sixth sense about who's for real and who's just kind of going to waste my time um so that is something that gives me a little bit of a advantage just kind of like having been around the block yeah that's that's a very valuable insight and so thank uh, yeah thanks for sharing that i think the the thing that is really hard to maybe hear when you're starting out is that there's a lot of that just yeah. you you just don't know you don't even know what you don't know and you know where you right. want to be but you have no idea what you're going to have to go through to get there. And it's not that right. anyone's putting up a wall or a barrier for you to get there. That's just you 
and you're it's it's there's a lot of your ability to to know a good client from a bad client no one's no one's stopping you from entering into the world of illustration and, and being all that you want to be but you have to be willing to put up with a lot of mistakes yeah. and trial and error and and at the end of the day if you're a little bit self-aware you can you can you can say i enjoyed that or i didn't enjoy that or i was good at that i wasn't good at that and so right. i think that's such a, a it's a it's a very simple thing to to know like you know you gaining more experience when you get older <laughs> it's just like yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but i think i think it's it's hard to to see that uh when you're at the bottom of the mountain and there's a, a, a cloud and you can't see the top of the mountain. Like there's, there's just that necessary totally. climbing and, and getting scrapes and bruises as you go along the way and, and figuring out how, how that climb works, yeah. but you, you do catch a stride. Yeah. And it, it's not like I'm done either. Like I can look back and say, Oh, here's all the skills I acquired in my twenties that helped mm. me today. And now I feel like it's that thing, like you said, of I don't know what I don't know in terms of what I'll learn in the next 10 years, but it's absolutely ongoing and it just gets more and more refined. Like I can give you an example. Um, so I re-watched re our first chat this morning. Um, and at one point I very, confidently say oh if the new york times were to call me tomorrow and ask me to do an illustration i know that i could do it and it's funny because now that a year and a half has gone by i would say to katie in that video like i don't know if you could do that like maybe you could but i don't know if it would be that good you know <laughs> so it's that thing of i didn't know that i didn't know like i thought i could do that kind of illustration mm -hmm. um but like for example um i did work in the last a couple of months ago for a magazine in australia doing a full page illustration um and for example i had a really long turnaround time um the client was super easy to work with i felt like i did a good job the illustration is good um but i don't know that experience just makes me realize like i just kind of barely passed the hurdle in this job with a small magazine like what made me think that i could like run with the big dogs in the new york times you know like there's a level of i understand that those kinds of gigs like it's a super fast turnaround time. Like you've got to sort of like come up with a bunch of ideas on a dime. Um, you know, the quality has got to be really good, et cetera. Yeah. So yeah. yeah Does that make sounds, sense? Yeah. It just sounds like you're growing wiser. And when we're young, yeah. you know, like we, we do a lot of things that are above our, our ability, but we don't know until we try. Mm -hmm. And it's not that, mm -hmm. We always get a chance to try like i still haven't done a new york times piece but the right. the more i i i think yeah i think i think the more you move along you grow equally aware of your weaknesses as you do with your strengths right you you never right. grow less critical of your work you you learn to manage your self crit you learn how to put it in its place i think like you learn how to mm -hmm. use it as a tool better but you don't ever outgrow yourself critic if you do that's that's actually not a good thing in my opinion but the i i remember you saying that because i watched the the video also and, and that stuck out to me i was like wow i wouldn't feel that confident about that but i think it's just because i know now exactly um, like and in fact i don't even know if i'd want to work like i would i would probably if the new york times commissioned me and i had the time i i would i think i'd, I'd try to make it happen but given that they have crazy short turnarounds and I don't like working on short turnarounds, I have a lot of, like we were talking about before, there's a lot of process for me to get to my ideas. Like there's a, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a third draft, fourth draft person. 
<laughs> and and I don't know, I've had those fast turnaround jobs with other editorial clients before, and it's been, uh, I, I'm never exactly happy with those those spontaneous jobs, but um, yeah, yeah I, I, I love that you brought that back because I think that's just an important part of, of, of growing as an illustrator is finding out like the more experience you have, the more you realize like how inexperienced you are and that never ends. Exactly. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, exactly. Do you think New York Times would still be a, a, a dream client for you? Definitely. Yeah. If only because I myself am a huge reader of the New York Times. Okay. You know, it's it's not one of these things where I say it because everyone else says it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like the New York Times is actually a huge part of my family, like history and everything. Yeah. Because like my my parents read the whole Times every morning. You know. That's insane. So it's like I can't close, get through a single close article. To home. Yeah. I can't get, they're too long. <laughs> yeah I read the headline a little bit I'm like okay that's that's the perspective of New York Times and then I move on right yeah so I, I consume a lot of like articles you know mm. the Times the New Yorker the Atlantic um so I would really love to illustrate for a publication that I read like duh you know that's amazing but yeah it's not like saying it because that's the cliche thing that every illustrator says yeah, for me, honestly, it would be a feather in my cap more than anything. Right, I'm it's not, that too. I'm not a huge, like I would, I, and and I actually don't think you need to be an avid consumer of a, of a newspaper in this case in order to illustrate for it. I think I think that fresh perspective coming from a total outsider mm. view mm -hmm. can also be good, but but I think that is. A really important thing to weigh out is like why do i want this job do i want it because it's the the industry um holy grail or do i really want it so i think that's right. that's good so new york times if if you're uh if you're watching <laughs> this video new york times if you're wherever you are <laughs> katie shelley's up for hire she's a good illustrator and uh she's she reads it every every day <laughs> my parents my parents, parents. That's a, they're retired parents read it every day so yeah <laughs> you know something that i wanted to add to what we were just saying before about like the more experience you get the more inexperienced you realize you are mm -hmm. like reflecting over the clients that i've had since we last spoke because i have had a lot you know like jobs like this and the mm -hmm. little things that come my way through you know, contacts or people who find me on social media. I've had a couple of people just find me on social media and say like, hey, will you do this or that for me? And I always say yes. Um, I feel like this is kind of like one of these, it sounds like a sort of cliche, uh, like, um, like these self-help things that you see on Instagram or whatever like the the clients that i've get that i've gotten have always been like at the level that i that was appropriate to to where i was that's like, yeah that's that's a really cool insight yeah so i may have had like lofty ambitions just right off the bat like i want to illustrate for the new york times but i think i hear a lot of other right people who are starting kind of say things like this yeah. But like once you set out, like, you know, I had a client who is a, a PhD student in California and she was like, I want some illustrations for my dissertation to make it more fun. Mm -hmm. Cool. I did that, you know? Yeah. So you, you're like, talking about read readiness, like you're getting yeah. clients that are ready for you and, and that you're ready for and yeah. you're at the, the right levels of growth or however you want to measure those levels those clients are right for you then right yeah and like that job was fun it was a challenge it was kind of what i needed and mm -hmm. prepares me for the next thing you know yeah. even though maybe in my sort of mind i was you know too yeah. good for that or too you know wanted something bigger or better or something yeah i yeah. think i think that that's a, a mentality that you have 
an attitude that you have that I think will take you far because a lot of people think, oh, I'm not getting the, the New York Times. I'm not getting this, whatever the dream clients are. It's been two, three, four, five years. Why am I not right. there yet? Right. But what I see in, in what you're describing is basically a learner's attitude. Like you're like, no matter what, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm illustrating. I'm getting paid. Um, or I'm getting something from it. And there, I like, no matter what you're gaining from it and you're seeing the positive of it, you're seeing that you're learning from it and there's still more. And, and I think that's a very healthy and, and positive outlook. And it keeps you from, and I'm speaking maybe for myself, I, I feel like I have a bit of that too. That's what keeps me from despairing and when I'm comparing people to comparing myself to others and, and thinking about, right you know, my peer has now done New York Times and a New Yorker cover, why haven't I? But there's always that, that humility that, that you need to have is like, well, I haven't done the New York Times yet because maybe they're not the right client for me yet or ever. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'm not ready yet, yeah. yeah. And the longer I go on as an illustrator, I'm finding that the things that I thought that would be the brightest feathers in my cap are never going to be my my feathers uh and in it in it if if you i guess have the right mindset you can see that that's not only okay it's good like you find you find your pocket that you fit in and and you, and I, I i use i think my picture books are actually a really good example of this so the style of picture book that I've been working in is different than what I thought I would be working in. And I'm realizing that the thing that people like about my art is not what I, I personally thought was the best thing I had going. And it's not to say mm -hmm. that I, I'm wrong for liking what I like, but sometimes other people accidentally or naturally like, they find they they find out what you're good at before you do. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And and then you're like, oh, I am good at that and actually enjoy it. So there is that that element of growing into into uh I guess maturing as as an illustrator is just learning those things about yourself. And yeah. learning learning that what you what you envisioned, what you had put on the highest pedestal when you were, you know, I a young illustrator, those things just, it's just different when, once you come, come through a bit of experience. Yeah. And I, and that each job is an opportunity to practice. I really see it that way. Exactly. Yeah. And I would be getting in my own way of growth and even evolving my style and all the things that seem so important that are so important. Mm -hmm. Um, every job is an opportunity to do that. Even if the client seems like a really, just, just a small, humble client, um, I'm practicing. And I feel like kind of in that cheesy mystical way, like life is giving me the clients that are no, kind of at, at my level, you know? Yeah, it's a great, a great attitude. Well, um, I, think we're, I think we're coming on an hour uh, almost here so mm -hmm. maybe to wrap it up this is a good place to wrap it up um we've we've seen where you were mm -hmm. in 2019 and anyone you guys can go and watch the the previous video and i'll leave a link to it in the show notes um and we now see where you are today mm -hmm. i guess there's two questions here so the first is how do you feel about like ultimately, how do you feel today about where you are versus where you were? And if we were to have this conversation in another two years, where do you hope to be? Hmm, that's a great way to end. Um, I have learned so much since that last video. I've learned I've learned a lot about technical stuff. I've practiced a lot. 
I've learned a lot about what works and what doesn't work just on a level of illustration, like trying stuff out. I've learned a lot about like copyright and legal stuff that I didn't know before, um, talking to other illustrators and finding things out. Like I recently learned that you can't just do a portrait based on the photo. Like you have to like alter it somehow from the photo so that you're not ripping off that photographer's copyright, which I feel like um, a lot of people don't know that. And it's uh, very good scary. point. Yeah, it's scary to think that you could screw that kind of thing up. So this is the, sort of what I mean about like, if the New York Times were to call me and ask for a portrait of such and such person, I wouldn't have known that a year ago. Now I know, and I'm more prepared for that kind of job because I wouldn't make that kind of noob mistake. Um, so basically I've just learned all sorts of things in all areas of the industry. Um, I think I've committed also to it. Like there was always a part of me that had one foot out the door. Like, I don't know if this is going to work out and maybe I'm just going to quit. Mm -hmm, um, yeah. So I think I'm all in at this point after a couple years have gone by. And yeah, two years from now, I mean, if, I, if things just keep going the way they're going and I keep growing at the speed at which I've been growing, I will be totally happy with that. So just more of the same, really. More of learning those things that I didn't even know I didn't know. <laughs> and more of discovering my style and finding my voice and working my way up the client ladder, I guess you could say, in a way that I earn and not in a way that I feel like I should have. <laughs> so you're in it, you're, you're committed now and you're in it for the long haul. Mm -hmm, definitely. Well, that's great. Um, maybe, maybe to, before we kind of wrap it up, I want to give you an opportunity just to tell the audience uh, where they can find more of your work or, or um, yeah, where, where, where do you want people to find you from here? Sure. Um, my handle is interkatie, so like internet katie on Instagram and Twitter. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much, Katie, for the, the follow-up conversation. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited about uh, just like our conversation, the, the growth you've seen, you know, even just looking at, at your work and your website and your, your Instagram feed, I really do see a lot of growth and development and, and that striving to find your voice in a very like thoughtful and authentic way. And I think that's going to do, you're, you're going to do well with that. So uh, keep at it. And again, thank you so much for, for uh, following up today. And uh, I look forward to the next chat. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for everything you do for all of us newbies. You're the best. Oh, thanks. All right. Thank you so much, Katie. That was, it's just really encouraging to see the progress of other illustrators over time and also just really insightful. We can really see what a real process of a real illustrator kind of doing the hard work of showing up every day, making work, going through the struggle, and I think Katie's story is a, a really encouraging one and something that we can all take to heart. And I'll just say, I didn't say this in the video, but her experience is very similar to mine in the sense that it's not like you, you take the plunge and you become an illustrator and it's smooth sailing. There's just a lot of trial and error, there's a lot of surprises, there's some disappointments, but the important thing that I that I really think I admire and think is something for us to all learn from in Katie's case, and I said this in the conversation, uh, is just to have that attitude that you can do no wrong. Like whatever you're doing, you're learning, you're growing, and whatever's happening to you as an illustrator, whatever you're able to get in that moment is perfect for you in that moment. And that's such a good a good attitude to have is like whatever I got at that point in my life was exactly what I needed was exactly at my level and with that kind of attitude you just can only feel like you're winning so I really hope that you guys feel like you're winning in whatever you're doing and that you're encouraged to see whatever 
projects you get to work with now, whatever your opportunities that you're working on get to have right now, even if that's uh, taking a class, doing some kind of self-initiated project, or if you're working for a dream client, that is the, the opportunity that's perfect, perfect for you right now. So embrace that dive into it and just go into it with your whole heart and you can only come out the other side stronger and better. So anyway, thank you so much for watching guys. Again, my name's Tom Froze. You can find me on Instagram at Mr. Tom Froze and of course on my website tomfroze.com where you'll see of course my illustration work and a list of all my Skillshare classes to date. Anyway guys, thank you so much for watching another video and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.